Well, hello. I am happy to be here with the fabulous Kyle Benson. And I'm just going to introduce myself first, Kyle, and then I'm going to hand it over to you. Uh, my name is Brianna McWilliam, and I'm an author, educator, and licensed creative arts therapist. And I've been in the field for about 13 years now. And I am wild about attachment theory and love and relationships. And it's my goal to help people who feel fearful and kind of stuck in their romantic relationships move into a place of self-sovereignty so they can start calling in the soul-shaking passionate partnerships that they want. Um, so Kyle, I'm just going to hand it on over to you to introduce yourself. Perfect. I love that introduction. Um, I'm Kyle Benson. I'm a relationship coach. Uh, my website is kylebenson.net. And I really talk about um, attachment issues and committed relationships and particularly around conflict that arises. And so I really help couples and individuals learn how to become an expert on themselves and an expert on their partner. So the issues that they have in their relationships can actually be managed and is no longer a barrier to their emotional connection. And this is super exciting. I am so thrilled to be here because um, Kyle and I have joined forces to talk about some really common questions that are popping up in our respective audiences. Um, and I think today we were just going to have some fun riffing on some of the questions that came up and see what unfolds. Yeah. Um, so we've got a couple of them here. And Kyle, I'm just going to read the first one and maybe we can just see what comes up. Let's do it. Okay, so the first question that we had was, um, how can I, how can I communicate my needs to a partner in the relationship? Okay. I think it depends on kind of the types of needs that person wants. Um, and really, I think you and I are gonna have a lot of fun with this question, but for me, it really comes down to being clear on what that need is. Um, you know, typically if we look through attachment styles, people who tend to lean towards more avoidant, they've kind of adapted to neglect their needs and not be really attuned to what their needs are. And so it's usually after the fact of when something happens or conflict starts that they get angry or upset with their partner and they kind of distance. Um, whereas one of the things that I've worked with avoidant partners who are dating, uh, whether it's a care or an anxious partner, is really helping them become attuned to kind of what they need in a relationship, um, particularly around their need for space or their need to be able to have a transition time from when they're kind of spending time focused on things for themselves into relational time, because that's usually that period and that, that space between I'm by myself to I'm now dealing with the relationship can be a really stressful transition for someone who's avoidant. Um, and this goes a lot into attachment research that Stan Tacken talks about. And really for talking, if we're talking about that partner really needs space or they need some alone time, being able to communicate that in a way that their anxious partner still feels reassured that they matter to the avoidant partner. And that is really important for both individuals because they're essentially owning their attachment needs and at the same time able to be on the same page and work together to make ends meet. And so, for example, I had a couple who I was working with and the one of the partners would come home from work and another partner would be like, I just want to talk. I want to get to know you. How was your day? Like super excited, high energy. And another partner was just a little bit overwhelmed by that. They'd spent 45 minutes driving in the car. They had that, all that alone time and they needed a little bit more of a break to transition into kind of getting home. And so we ended up working out this kind of agreement where that, that partner would come in, say hi, tell the partner that they love them, then kind of go up to a room in the house and spend some time kind of adjusting and, and kind of getting back into the space of, all right, I'm ready to get back in relationship. And kind of in the mental space and the emotional space, and then they walk down the stairs and reconnect and they'd have a conversation and, and the whole night would start a lot better. This is much different than when they'd come home and all of a sudden it'd be a conflict practically every time. Um, and so with that partner is really getting him to honor his needs that he kind of does need space, um, and to be open with that. And when I work with couples, I have them do what I call a weekly state of the union meeting where they discuss the conflicts in the relationship. They discuss what's going well and what needs improvement. And with every couple I work with, they kind of have a checklist of some key things that show up in the relationship. So they're always staying on top of it. And if they can stay on top of it rather than letting it 
boil to kind of a, a big issue, they can kind of be preventative with it. And so that's one of the things they were doing. And that's been really helpful for them to manage some of those needs. That's just a sliver of some of the stuff that comes up. And Brianna, I know you have a lot more kind of experience with this too. <laughs> well, the first thing that comes up is my personal experience with that, which is like my father religiously to the point where it was kind of a joke in the family would always come home and lock himself in the bathroom for 45 mm -hmm. minutes to an hour. <laughs> Cause it was like the one private room in the house where people could not disturb him. Mm -hmm. um, but what also came up for me was actually this book um, by John Gray, the guy who wrote women are from Mars, men are from Venus. He also wrote this book called um, Mars and Venus, uh, Mars on fire and Venus on ice or something like that. And he talks about that, that that is a pretty common scenario uh, amongst couples, and I might just qualify heterosexual couples, that a uh, man will come home and need to have this like bubble of space before he can engage um, with any kind of social activity in the family or connecting to his spouse. And he actually says that that is a need for hormone replacement, that throughout the day, a man's testosterone is being turned out in such a way and that when he comes home, there actually needs to be a window in which that is replenished before he can step into um, what like oxytocin inducing activities like talking to his wife and cuddling and affection and listening and being attentive and that there's actually also like a, a keen biological component to that. Um, which I think is kind of interesting because it can afford some maybe empathy and also some understanding on the part of the partner that feels rejected or neglected in that moment when, you know, the person comes home. Right. And I think like, that person initially when without that understanding, without that knowledge for both partners, if there's conflict, that's just going to blow up. And the partner who's really wanting to connect and the, the other partner who just got home is needing that window there's so much personal meaning that's happening. The one partner who's like, I really want to connect to him now. My partner's so distant or they lock themselves in the bathroom. They don't care about me. I am now, I'm not important. And then the other partner is like, I can never do it right. Like there's all these issues that come up that really, when we don't understand each other or we don't understand our styles can really cause a lot more issues. Whereas if we kind of have the insight that you just kind of talked about, that's really helpful to not make it personal. And that's one of the key things if you are going to stay in a relationship with an avoidant um, who hopefully is working to become more emotionally available and understand themselves, you're also going to have to realize some of the things they're doing are not necessarily about you to depersonalize it. And that can actually make it easier for you to communicate your needs, open up about them um, and kind of have a better relationship with them. Yeah, I think the other thing, well, I guess there's two things I would add to that, and that is that. On the flip side of that, part of the reason why the, the the let's say a cisgendered female partner wants that contact is because for them, the oxytocin brings them back to a state of of calm and homeostasis. So it's a bit of a cruel joke that they both kind of need opposite things at the same time. Um, so that is, I think, what you're talking about, where you have that clear communication and uh, dialogue, so that those very real needs can get met. Um, the other thing that kind of comes up for me. And I tend to refer to avoidant individuals that have avoidant attachment as rolling stones <laughs> because I don't I, I the language. I think I feel like language helps construct our realities. So part of what I tend to do with people is change the language a little bit. Um, and I think there's a couple of things, too, when you have that conversation to think about, and that is that in the in maybe the quality of the communication like you know how you deliver that or how you have that conversation and how that gets delivered because there's so much that we communicate i'm going to say affectually but meaning like with our body language and with our tone of voice and with the amount of patience we're willing to have um so for me it's it's having compassionate communication and to me that speaks to like speaking to what the person's feeling versus what they're saying so so sometimes like someone might say um like you never listen to me, right? Or we never go out anymore. And so that's kind of like the surface layer communication, which is sounds a bit critical. And then there's like the what I call a deep structure communication or the, the communication of what they mean, which is that I miss you and I love you and I love spending time with you. And I'm just wondering if there's any way we can create time and space for that or, so that we can have more of that so that I can feel a bit more comfortable in the way things are going, right? So 
one sounds very different than the other. Right. And it, and it impacts your partner in a much different way. And this is one of the things, you know, I work in Dr. Gottman's Love Lab where I literally sit. We have couples. We put up wires on their faces. We have we measure their heart rates. We have all these things where we're measuring their physiological data. And then we have them, have them do these conflict conversations. Where we're like, what's a major issue in your relationship? Then we put them in the room and say, fight for 15 minutes and we'll see what happens. And then we go in and we actually code the conversation on positive and negative. And I have, as a coder, there's certain words that I'm looking for and gestures and facial features. But that's one of the things, right? Verona, you talked about criticism and that actually makes our partner more defensive. It makes them less open to willing to hear what our needs are. And as someone who's was anxious myself and who's really kind of earned my own security in, in my attachment style, is I've really had to learn how to deal with my anxiety and process it and look for the longing within my complaint, right? Because I used to be that type of partner who's like, you never want to spend time with me. You don't care about me. And what I really learned is that me just wanting to spend t more time with my partner and that I miss them, that I crave to spend time with them, that I want to know that I'm important to them. But when I go in and, and attack my partner and say, you never spend time with me, uh, they're going to just shut down. They're going to be like, well, yep, I can't ever do it right. And then you actually lose your opportunity. Whereas if you kind of slow down, get to connect with what your longing is, you can express that in a way that actually moves you closer towards the goal you want. And that's essentially building emotional intelligence. And for someone who is anxious, that's really helpful. And someone who's avoiding that also helps them from shutting down because it's so interesting when working with couples, it can be a simple phrase, a quick sentence that can just take an interaction that's going this way and just drop it. And so we really have to be mindful of how we say things. And a lot of research on conflict talks about, actually there's a, research study from Dr. John Gottman, where he found that 96% of the times the way a conversation starts at how it is how it ends. And so if you start at negative, it's going to end negative practically every single time. Whereas if you're a little bit gentler and you show more of these vulnerable, softer feelings and these longings for connections, longings for attachment, you're going to have a much higher chance of the conversation going in the direction you want. Right. Yeah. And if it doesn't, that's good information for you too. <laughs> so, a little bit. Well, so for example, I have sometimes people will come into my group and they'll say, um, you know, I'm afraid of expressing my needs because I think it's going to push my partner away because they've had this experience of wanting to have a real conversation about needs, desires, expectations. Where's this going? Can we have this conversation? And then the partner disappears. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is that <laughs> That's good information <laughs> because if someone's not able to be present and have that conversation with you and talk about their needs, and desires, let alone your needs and desires, then the relationship probably wasn't on steady ground to begin with. Yeah, and it's it's a really tough thing because as a partner, you really want them to become emotionally available. You want them to work on things. And there's some partners who with their window of tolerance of dealing with conflict, dealing with these things, they just will bolt. And that makes it really hard for you to trust them. It makes it really hard to get to under, get an understanding of their commitment level, which is really foundational to the attachment system, right? If you don't have trust, if you don't have commitment, if I can't depend on you, if you're not really available, I am going to become insecure. And so it's really important, right? A lot of couples, there are couples who I have worked with distancers or you know, avoidant individuals who are willing to work on it. And when they are willing to work on it, we can get to some tough stuff and, and really get through reconnecting and getting them to stay engaged. But there's also people who will just vanish for two, three, five days, sometimes weeks, will avoid all contact because they're so overwhelmed by that. And Stan Tacken talks about um, how they are focused on what is a one person system, whereas a relationship is really a two person system. It's two people becoming a team and working together, whereas kind of the, you know, an avoidant who a rolling stone, as you might call it, they feel so overwhelmed. They really just need to get the heck out of there um, and they avoid. And that's their adaptive strategy. Um, and unless they're willing to kind of explore what comes up with that, it's going to be really tough for you to build that secure relationship that you're wanting. Well, so being an avoidant, <laughs> I can say that, you know, primarily I've kind of swung back and forth in my own personal history between anxi anxiety, 
and avoidance. And I, I actually feel like I'm more in a secure place these days, but probably what sent me more towards an avoidant end of the spectrum was being more anxious in a relationship. Um, but it's interesting because I look at my past and I think about the relationships that I've had. And there are instances where I was actually more avoidant, but my inner monologue was very anxious. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> I actually had this conversation with my mother over dinner. And I don't know how it came up. She was just like, yeah, when you were a baby, you always just needed this space. And I was just like, oh, it all makes sense now. <laughs> but um, I think part of, too, what it, it's not just that. So maybe this is what triggered something in me. But it's not just that the avoidant has to figure themselves out in order to show up because the anxious is like ready to go and willing to do everything. You know, it's also that, and I refer to people who have anxious attachment as open hearts, that they also have to take a look at and examine their motivations for what they're doing. Because if if you are having, like if you're showing up and you're like, these are my needs, this is what I'm looking for. I'm asking for some definition in this relationship because I need some sense of felt security here. And I need a few things that I can know I can rely and depend on, which is not an unreasonable thing to say and to ask. And then you are met with someone who just disappears or maybe yeses you to your face and then disappears, or maybe, you know, can't handle that conversation. If you then continue to pursue that person and you're going after them, now it's really a question of what are you egoically attached to in this moment? What story are you telling yourself about what you deserve, need and want and can get in relationship, right? Because at that point, it's not necessarily about what they are and are not getting from someone else. It's about what are you, what, what narrative are you playing out in this scenario? So there's also, I think, a level of, and even in the context of relationship, there's a level of taking ownership of personal authority and being like, I don't need that in my life. And the world is full of endless possibility of love and resources. And I can meet a partner who's willing to have that conversation with me. And, you know, when you were talking, the thing that came up for me when sort of this notion of like partner one, partner two, and then the third thing that is created, you know, in the space between them being the relationship, I was thinking about tango. <laughs> and I had a wonderful conversation with someone recently who had expressed that a lot of, of stepping into a sense of security was learning how to tango. Are you, is that you or is that me? That's um, me. That's you. That's me. <laughs> and so I like whenever bells come in, I think it's the universe being like, yes, you're on it. Um, and in tango, there's this um, there's this way that we perceive it as this dance of lovers and this very intense kind of passionate dance. But she was explaining to me that the, with the mechanics of tango, it's not necessarily that one is leading and the other is following all the time. Both partners have to be on their axis. Like they both have to be on a certain axis and center of balance. And then there is the dance between them. And that they actually more often than not dance cheek to cheek facing, you know, so they're not always actually like like gazing into each other's eyes, they both have to be like on their game in order for the dance to work well and to to remain balanced. And I thought that was really a beautiful metaphor for our in, like interdependency in relationships. It is. So I'm a salsa dancer, and I used to dance on a salsa team. Um, and it's one of the things like as a guy, you have to lead, and so you're leading. But I also learned to follow really well too because you really have to understand what is it like? How do I move someone? What are the cues they're giving me that I'm going too fast or I'm not giving a good enough heads up? You have to be really attuned to each other. And, and dancing is a really great metaphor for a healthy relationship because when the dance is not going well, we're stepping on each other's toes, we're frustrated, and then we might start blaming our partner for, the, for their issues or, or accusing them for making the dance go wrong when we also have a role. And, and I love that you kind of brought that back into the conversation because as an anxious partner, we do pursue, which can make an, a, a distance or want to distance even more. Um, whereas if we can go into what's going on for us, why am I so f chasing after this? Is there a narrative about a belief about myself, a story that I'm unworthy of love or that I have to work super hard to earn love? Um, that can be another barrier that can prevent us from having that really fun and playful, secure dance that we're really longing for. Um, and with the anxious partners, one of the things I really have them do is to help them process that anxiety into a superpower. Because as anxious partners, our initial reaction is, I'm feeling anxious. I need to react to whatever that anxious thing is. 
Um, but that can lead to creating some messes. Whereas if we can sit with it just for a little bit, we can collect some data, whether it's true or not. And there's, in, in my own work, because I've been doing a lot of this work myself, I realized that some of the things that I, my brain made up was like, oh, my partner did this, like she's cheating on me, she doesn't care about me. And while I have real experience of that from past relationships, when I was able to soothe myself just enough to give my partner some space to see if that was true, she proved me wrong. Um, and so that's something that is really helpful too, is like, if you are an anxious partner, you also play a role in the dance of your relationship, um, just as someone who might be avoidant. And so it is like getting into figuring out how do I dance well with this person? How do we as a team work together instead of going, well, I need you to be more emotional. I need to do this stuff. Actually seeking to understand what's their difficulty with opening up. What's that mean? Where did their family culture how do they learn from their family culture on about feelings, about needs, about expressing themselves versus how you grew up? And there's a lot of deep inner work that I do with couples around that, that when partners get to understand that and start to communicate those differences, we can start to bridge that gap that they experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and Brianna, I think you're kind of getting something into kind of the anxious partner in terms of relationships and some of the dating part. And I'd kind of love you to dive into that. Well, tell me what, what specifically, like what, what question were you interested in? Kind of about the internal, internal work that you were just talking about right before I jumped in and, and started talking <laughs> for a little bit. Well, I think it's, I think of it as being, so I tend to approach things from kind of a psycho-spiritual perspective. So I, I believe that we have an essence of being, um, which is by its very nature, not really knowable to us in its entirety. Um, and that it is connected to all that is or whatever it is that but the, the sort of life force that ebbs and flows all around us. And that um, we have parts of ourselves so that that there are parts you might call them archetypes or um, like levels of consciousness within us. Some people refer to it as like the wounded inner child or something like that that exists within us and that these are actually parts of consciousness that we need to be in conversation with on a regular basis in order to be able to answer questions like, am I just being reactive to my attachment system right now or to my anxiety that I'm feeling right now? Or is this uh, a level of intuition and discernment that I have about the way this relationship is going, right? Um, and really the only way to be able to know about and answer those questions is to be in active process with the inner dialogue. Um, so I know that's a bit abstract, but if you could imagine like, some of us might think of ourselves like, we tend to think of our thinking self or our waking self as like the ego mind. So this is the part of you that thinks about things and responds and has that that sort of immediate response to something. But to my mind, the part of you that's able to step into that place of earned security is the observing part of you. So the part of you that doesn't just think the thoughts, but reflects on the nature of your thoughts. Right. Um, and so that's really when we start talking about mindfulness and practice. Right. Being able to. Um, sink into a moment. And, and to my mind, that's about being present in your body very specifically. Because when you have experience, every experience we have gets translated into some form of an electrical impulse, because that's how we, we take in experience. And so to my mind, that that's a charge. And that charge can get embedded in different places in your body. Um, and so part of the work of being more secure is that mindfulness practice of sinking into your body tapping into the observing self and being able to have a conversation with those different parts. Cause if something's feeling, I hear the word triggered a lot, but I, I, I can dig into the definition of the word triggered. But when people are having an more often than not, they mean an uncomfortable feeling as opposed to like a severe flashback or something like that. I'm just going to stay on the level of an uncomfortable feeling. So there's a powerful, uncomfortable feeling. And to my mind, that is a feeling that is um, layered on top of one of these parts. That's like, please look at this because I, I want to be integrated into your experience right now. And, and whatever that response is, at one point it served you. You know, it is a coping mechanism. And at one point it did serve you. So in the now, we need to celebrate that, but then give it a new job because we're trying to let that part of you know that you're not in that circumstance anymore. And the skills and coping mechanisms you've gained are still valuable, but they can be applied in such a way that you can step into this like vision of love and, and abundance that you want in your life. 
Yeah, and and I love what you're talking about because it's such the, it's the deeper inner work of kind of your own healing of whether and, you know doing that in relationship, doing it with yourself, and really getting attuned to noticing which parts or I call them. Right. I really talk about sometimes that inner child is hijacking you because it's so used to the, the past experiences where you were abandoned or, or these other things. And that 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 physiological memory comes up and that those emotions come up and that activates you. And then you become active in that way of thinking, which is an insecure way of thinking. And if we think about the difference really between insecure and secure thinking is it's really how we navigate what comes up with our emotions um, and really our. I mean, we can talk about kind of uh, um, neurologically, but I'm not going to get into that. But, but we'll do just, that on the next question. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, you're essentially right in doing that and understanding these different parts and building a relationship, which is really what I encourage my clients to. Is you have this younger part that is screaming for attention for some reason. Um, it might not have the right information, or it might be operating in something from the past, and so we have to then sit with that part and have kind of our adult part. That's kind of what I talk about. Come in and go, okay, is this child, is, is there actually a threat going on here that we need to pay attention to? Or is this part just really scared that as I get closer to this person, as I trust more on this person that they're going to leave or that I really don't have anything to worry about. And my partner has given me evidence that they are there for their, for me, that they are trustworthy, that they are worthy of me continuing to invest into this relationship. Um, and I love Brianna, how you explain all that, because that is a lot of the inner work I do with individuals and couples. Um, that is where the transformation happens when we actually are able to do the work that Brianna's talking about and experientially have that reflected in our behaviors and in our relationships. And that's actually how we build an earn secure attachment style, which is what their research calls it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think I like the way that you said have an experience of because i think so my background is in creative arts therapies and part of how we facilitate the the creation of that experience so there's so in therapy it's it's the recreation of a relationship right the establishment of a connection to someone and in the space being able to allow those things to come out and be alive in the interaction with someone in real time and space and so with creative arts therapies we kind of take that a bit further and we use the creative process as a way to explore that through metaphor and things like that and also do the body activation so tapping into the charges that may be stored somewhere within you um, and also that oftentimes the language that we have that creates in the literature they call it internal working models but basically a love map for how you respond to certain situations in relationship that all of that especially when it's formed is probably formed on a nonverbal level Right. Or um, implicit, implicit kind of memories, pathways and things like that. So and that is that's and that's kind of a world of symbolism and, and metaphor. And and that especially because it's now in the unconscious self, part of working with symbolism and metaphor is a nice way to to create that experience in real time and space in the present moment and be able to work through it. Um, and one thing I would just add to that is that. I had an interesting, someone asked me a really interesting question connected to what we're talking about, about transformation last night and this notion of transformation and betterment and all of that. And I think one thing I would, I would say about that is even if we talk about, even if we use the word like integration, right, that, that we want to bring these different parts of ourselves into balance, let's say, it's, it's my perception that we are never really truly fractured even if we are struggling with trauma or dysregulation or something like that, that it's more that we're kind of like a light bulb that like when you, you have like a light bulb that's shining and then you throw some paint on it, only like portions of that you become visible to you, but the light bulb doesn't shine any less bright just because there's this coating on top of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You just can't see it. And so I, I really, I, I think I mentioned this now cause I just want it to, to clarify when we talk about things like integration and parts and stuff that I never, I don't believe that we are ever at any time fractured, but that we sort of are given this perception and or this notion that we are, and then we start to operate from that place. And so part of the work is maybe just wiping off some of that paint, you know, like that's my mind. It's more of an enfoldment in a way. Yeah. And, and I love, I mean, 
I'm so excited about this because it's so true. And, and this is how I work, see my clients. I see how I see myself. We are secure, but we, we adapted in insecure ways. And that way of kind of communicating, that way of connecting with others became the style that we adapted and we haven't quite got back to being secure or using those more secure strategies more often. And going back into what you're talking about a few minutes ago around kind of the meaning we make of things, right? We, especially younger, we can't, we don't really have the language for going, oh, well, mom's not available or dad's not available. They're never, you know, I cry, they don't come, da, 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 da. Um, but we make sense of that, right? Our brain's like, oh, well, you know, I have no impact on them. I must not matter or these things. And those also in our adult relationships become another narrative too. You know, I hear a lot of people who are anxious, they often come to me of like, I'm not worthy of love. I really have this true belief that I'm unworthy of, I'm not belonging of it. Everyone's gonna abandon me. And there's some pretty amazing people, like they're doing amazing things in the world. And um, I always talk about how like, they already have the secure part within them, but they're listening to this other story that is giving, that they have given so much weight to. Mm -hmm. And if we start to get them to listen to the other story or as you call that their essence, um, they can really start to behave and act and think in these more secure ways. And that's essentially what secure attachment is. It's thinking in these ways that, okay, I don't have to react to this right now. Let me sit with it. Then let me respond in the best way possible. Whereas anxious and avoidant individuals, they have a different template or what I call a blueprint on how to respond to difficult emotions that come up. Um, and so I just want to highlight that as Prina talks about, it's really wiping the pain off that light bulb and learning how to do that in a compassionate, loving way. Um, because it's not only your relationship with someone else, but also your relationship with yourself. That is also another part that impacts the dynamics within romantic relationships. I love that. Yeah. And actually that may be a good place to close our discussion on this particular question. Perfect. Let's do it. All right. Well, thank you everybody for watching and stay tuned because Kyle and I will be back with a lot more of your frequently asked questions. Bye guys.